Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we come to you this morning and our hearts are full of the truth that we have heard, the truth that we have sang. We are reminded at this time of the incredible power and the incredible depths and the incredible nature of your love towards us. We are reminded of the fact that the separation, the distance that our sin has created between us and yourself is vast. Our sin nature, it does not, it does not cause us to just be an offense to you. It's not just an annoyance to you or something that is trivial, but Lord, our sin is, it separates us from you to the point that your word calls us enemies. The gap was so far, your holiness could not entertain or be in the presence of us. And it was not something that you could just ignore either. For you sent your son to die, not just for people, but for your enemies. And we, we can hardly fathom this. Your word says, for scarcely a righteous man will someone die. For rarely will a good man someone dare to die. But while we were yet sinners... Christ died for the ungodly. And Lord, as we are, think about this morning and what we are here to celebrate, we are reminded of the reality that it took the death of your son, but the seal of that salvation, the seal of your approval on what Jesus did was the resurrection. He did not stay in the grave. The grave could not hold him. He did not uh, stay in the grave. He did not die eternally. No, he rose from the grave on the third day. And as we've heard or even this morning from the sunrise service, because he lives, we live also. Because he has rose from the grave, we too one day shall rise. That this corruptible vessel, these bodies, must put on incorruptible. Lord, as we give attention to your word coming up, whether we have heard this over a thousand times or whether we're hearing it for the first time, may you work in such a way to use the power of your word, the power of the resurrection, to impact our hearts and change us from the inside out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are reading from Matthew 28 this morning, Matthew 28, 1 through 18. I encourage you to take, your, take the Bible and turn there with me and read along with me, if you will. Matthew 28, 1 through 18. Through 20, okay, I will ignore what this says. Matthew 28 through 20. Makes more sense that way anyway. On verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly 
and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and rang, uh, and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. The passage that we're looking at this morning, the resurrection passage, is one of four different descriptions of the resurrection in four different Gospels. And as we read earlier in John chapter 20, you have many, many details that you don't have in this passage. And in fact, you have many details in the other passages, in Luke and even in Mark, that you don't have here. In fact, this is, this is, there's a lot missing as far as the actual details of the account in Matthew chapter 28 here. But it's actually for a very important reason, because the book of Matthew and the, and, and the Lord ultimately desires for us to see something very specific here in this passage. And as you read through the passage, you actually can see this. There is this word that keeps coming up in the passage. It's the word go. The word go. Look at it with me, verse 7. You'll see there, go quickly. In verse 9, it says, as they went, and then it says, go and tell. In verse 11, it says, as they were going. And in verse 19, it says, go. When you read through the passage and you see repeated words like this, you begin to say, I think tr Matthew's trying to get something across here. That there is, there is a natural, um, uh, uh, a divine mission that should happen as we witness and as we understand the reality of the resurrection. And so we get other things from other passages of Scripture when it comes to the resurrection, but this passage really helps us to see the mission of the resurrection. So I was looking up mission uh, a couple of, a few days ago. Somebody asked me if I weren't a pastor, what would I what would I have done? Like growing up and graduating from high school, what I've done. I think I, I probably would have ended up in the military. My grandfather's career military. My dad was in the military. I think I probably would have ended up in the military. And so I looked up what a mission is and how a mission works in the military. If uh, somebody is, and I and I read this. It says this. In a time-constrained environment, a platoon leader typically develops only one COA. However, at, as time permits, he will develop many COA. For the comparison of purposes, time, as time allows, he begins TLP. After that, he issues his own war, war, Nord, war Nord, and until he has received comp the company's third War Nord, or until he has enough information to proceed, he not he. Uh, cannot wait to, he does not have to wait to, to repeat the O-Pord before starting to develop his own tentative plan. And after that, I knew exactly what a mission was. All of these different acronyms. I had, to, I had to look up the acronyms. I should have just called my grandfather. I'm sure he knows all these acronyms. TLP is 
troop leading procedure, COA is course action, warn order is warning order. Why didn't they just say that? Anyway, um, operation, uh, OPORD is operations order. I mean, it's not that much different. Anyway, um, but all that to say that you have a, a lot of details actually in this document that I found on a military mission. There's all kinds of things that you have to factor in. You have to factor in the terrain, and the weather and the risk um, and the, uh, the, the, the possibilities of risk and the level of opposition and all these kind of things before you put down a, a platoon leader, uh, you know, establishes a plan to be able to execute that plan and that is called a mission. It has a clear objective and a plan and objective and then they're able to go for it and accomplish the mission. And you actually see that in this passage. We're going to see that the mission in this case, the resurrection mission, actually starts with a personal experience. You've got to be able to see and understand and know the resurrection. And then we're going to see it meets opposition in verses 11 through 15. And then we're going to see in verses 16 through 20 that the mission reaches an objective. We're going to see a clear objective to the mission in verses 16 through 20. Through 20. So we'll begin by looking at the resurrection and as it begins with personal experience. And we see that there are these women, it says after the Sabbath, Sunday is what we're talking about, the first day of the week, after the Sabbath on, on Sunday, they meet and they come, to the, they come to the tomb and you've got these women that witness the resurrection. Notice what happens here. You've got Mary and uh, Mary Magdalene and, and uh, another Mary. Uh, you potentially have actually four women here, possibly, uh, that they all witness the resurrection. Uh, verse 1, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and Mary came to see the tomb. Now immediately you actually notice something about this text when you see these women are witnesses. Why, why is it that women are the first witnesses? Um, it's a kind of a question. By the way, some people actually suggest that this is a fictitious story, that there wasn't actually a resurrection, that there weren't actually witnesses, that this was actually all fiction. Well, I will tell you that this, was, this is really bad fiction, because in the first century, uh, you had, it was really even debatable, this isn't right, but it, wasn't, it was really debatable as to whether a woman should be, is a credible witness. Uh, you all women would not want to live in the first century, I'll just let you know. But, but so, so to think that this, if they were putting together some sort of compelling, compelling story to convince people of a fake resurrection and that they really wanted people to see, they wouldn't do it this way. They would have men because men were considered to be more credible witnesses. This is a true story, and there are certain indicators that show this is very, this is, this is not something made up, and that's, that's one of the things that we see in the passage. You have these ladies, and they come first, and there are some people that say, well, well uh, God was trying to have the ladies come first because he uses weak people, and that's a possibility. That may be why the, the, these ladies were uh, not, not act, that ladies are weak, but he uses sort of the oppressed and those kind of things. It's possible that that was the reason. Uh, others suggest that, um, that uh, one different, different idea or another, but actually, I think what it really is is that they were there. I think it's actually a little more simple. In fact, they've been there the whole time. And Matthew really emphasizes the idea of them being witnesses and being there. You'll see this if you want to look back to Matthew 27, if you have your Bibles open there. Verse 55, you'll see, And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministered to him, were there. See, they were there. And they were looking afar off. This is on, uh, Christ, as Christ dies on the cross, and these women are there. They're viewing the death of Christ as he dies on that cross. And the same women are there for his burial. burial. If you look just a few verses down, verse uh, 61, and Mary Magdalene was there. You can see it again. They were there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. The, the, why were these ladies depicted as the witnesses? It was because they were there. And the, and the angels here, that, come, that they're there, that we see that there's this earthquake that occurs uh, in the passage, and that signifies something important. In the Old Testament, you have 
different times where something of great magnitude occurred, like uh, Mount Sinai. You have an earthquake there in Exodus 19, 18. In Mount Horeb with Elijah, you have another one. At the end times, there's different earthquakes. So when something momentum is, momentous is going to happen, a lot of times there is an earthquake involved. You've got this angel, and actually there's more than one. There's probably two angels there, but the, the, the passage talks about one angel because it really, is, it really is trying to get to a specific point. And this angel rolls the stone away. Now, he doesn't roll the stone away to let Jesus out. Jesus is already gone. And he rolls the stone away, sits on top of the stone. Why? So that people can see that there is an empty tomb. And so he does this, and as this occurs, you've got these soldiers, and the passage says they feared, and then they were as dead, is how it describes it. They were as dead. Now, it's a little hard to tell exactly what happened there. They're shocked. Did they pass out? Did they, they just totally pass out of this sheer shock of this of this angel appearing and all this. I mean, that's possible. Uh, we don't exactly know, but I think the reason that it's described there as dead is there's a little bit of irony here in the passage. You have these people who were alive when Jesus was dead to protect the tomb, and yet Jesus is alive, and they're as dead. Uh, there, we, we, have, we see this victory over the situation by Jesus in this passage. So these women come, and the angel says in verse 5, uh, do not be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who is crucified. They realize why they're there, and it says in the pa passage, he is not here, for he is risen as he said. This angel reminds them. Now just imagine, these ladies, they've witnessed the, the, the death of Christ, They've witnessed the burial of Christ. They aren't expecting the resurrection, even though Jesus said many times that he would rise from the grave. In fact, Matthew 16, 21, he says that, that he, he will be raised the third day. He prophesies this. Matthew 17, 23, and they will kill him, and the third day he will, he will be raised up. Uh, and then Matthew 20, 18 through 19, again, he said, I'll be raised the third day. He, he's prophesying several times, and yet they really didn't put it together. It's amazing. We, heard, we, we remembered from, uh, from the, morning sur the, uh, the, uh, the sunrise service that even after he rose from the grave, and even after these ladies are going to go tell the disciples, they're still kind of not sure how this is working. And, and so these ladies did not expect to see an empty tomb and an angel and somebody announcing, hey, he is risen as he said. Come, it says, come see. I want you to actually look and see for yourself that there is actually an empty tomb here. It's an amazing story when you think about it. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. He's gone. Jesus has risen from the grave. These witnesses show the bodily resurrection of Christ. The very witnesses that saw him die and saw him buried in that particular tomb and knew exactly where to go witnessed the fact that, this, this, that Jesus had risen from the grave. And the angel says something next. We have our first go. Go quickly and tell the disciples. Go, go quickly. Uh, this is like a get, a, get a move on here. Okay, you've seen, come and see. Okay, now go. Go quickly and tell what you have seen. Relay what you've seen here. And indeed, uh, Scripture says, He is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So the angel is reminding, uh, reminding them that Jesus actually said, we find this actually recorded in Matthew 26, that Jesus actually said that he would die, rise from the grave, and then he would meet them in Galilee. But after I have, verse 32 of that passage, but after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. The angel is reminding them that he actually said he was going to do this and meet them in Galilee. The angel's putting all of these things together for these women. And if you could just kind of put yourself in these ladies', um, in, in these ladies shoes, they're like, whoa, whoa. What is going on here? There's a lot to take in. And that's why we find in verse 8, there's two things going on here. We've got two things. We've got two attitudes. 
fear and great joy at the same time. Now, that's not hard to imagine, is it? You've got these ladies, they've got, they're, they're, they're like, fear, like, what is all of this? The earthquake and the, 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 the angel, and there's, he's glowing with white light, and this is, and, and, and then, and, and by the way, if you were going to write a story, if you're going to write, like, actually just come up with something, you wouldn't say the ladies feared. You would say, and they were, ama- they were amazed, and they, went, that, you know, they would make them something. No, they actually feared. In fact, in Mark 16, the, another passage on this, it actually says that they feared so much, they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone at first. They, they, didn't, they, did, they were so afraid that they didn't want to say anything to anybody. Can you imagine that? Sure. I mean, who, have you ever seen something that you go, oh, man. I'm not sure if I want to relay this. I'm not sure it could be tr- like, mm-mm, I'm not, uh, this happened this week to probably all of us. I woke up, I don't remember what morning it was, but I woke up one day, it was a th- you guys know what I'm talking about, Thursday morning, and the key bridge had fallen. The first thing I saw, I was like, what a sick joke. That could not be, this has to be some weird thing. And then I heard another news report, and I'm like, okay, well, they're literally talking about all of the different details of this. This actually did happen, and I'm seeing on the news, and I'm seeing, what am I seeing? I'm seeing eyewitness accounts, because we all have phones. Somebody took a video, and you're actually seeing the whole thing in process. Why? Because you've got a witness. And then, obviously, you know, by, you know, I finally, I, I guess I'm a skeptical sort, but after a while, I'm like, okay, this actually happened. I can't, I mean, it's hard to even, it's, it was hard to process. I've been over that key bridge dozens and dozens of times. I grew up with it. I mean, you drive on 695, you see it in the horizon, and now you don't. And so this is much greater, much more momentous, much more powerful, and they're fearful, and they're like, should we tell anybody? But there's also great joy, because their friend is alive, and he is doing exactly what he said he would do, and so there's this great, it doesn't just say joy, it says great joy. So they've got this fear on the one hand, and great joy on the other, and the way the passage lays it out, it looks very much like joy's winning out because they begin to head, eventually, at some point, they head toward the disciple. Now, keep in mind here as we're going through this passage that you actually have about 15 to 20 days from the beginning of this passage to the end of this passage. These are broad brushstrokes with a very important message, go. You need to go. This is the mission. So understand that as we go through this. So they've decided that they're going to go, and on their way, they encounter Jesus. Um, the, the, the passage seems to indicate that they had already decided to go, like but the, the way it's put. But certainly, when they see Jesus, what happens? Well, Jesus says to them, rejoice. The way I read the passage, I kind of look at it, and it goes, you know, they had fear and joy, fear and great joy, and maybe there's a battle going on inside, and they run into Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, do, choose the rejoicing. You need to rejoice over this. Dude. I'm alive. So they say they, they do. In fact, actually what they do is they fall by their feet, and they worship him, which is exactly what they should do. This is Jesus who is alive in front of them. They realize he is the risen Lord. He is the Savior. And they fall down, and they worship him. And after they worship him, when they realize who he is, when they give him the honor that is due him, then Jesus, what does Jesus say? Same thing. We see the same thing. Go and tell. The angel says, go quickly and tell them. Now Jesus, Jesus himself, he allowed them to worship him. Why? Because he's worthy of worship. And then he says, go tell. Verse 10, and Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So what do they do? Well, they they do just that. They go go to Galilee so that they will see him. So what we see actually so far as we look at this passage and everything that's going on is we see we see that they needed to come and see the resurrection, see what happened, that he was not there. They then encountered Jesus, and they worship him. And from then on, it looks very much like they're just going and doing, they want to tell everyone. 
Now, that shouldn't surprise us. It really shouldn't surprise us that they want to tell everyone. I mean, think about it. Think about the things that we, it's just very, you know, when you're, when you're moved by something or you're excited about something, you want to tell people. I think of a little, a little child who gets a new bike. I remember my first new bike. It was a BMX bike. I didn't have a clue how to ride it. And uh, I was so excited about it. I went outside and my dad tried to show me how. I said, no, I'll figure it out. I did. It was weird. I mean, I don't want to let him help me. And I went down the hill, and I fell like 50 times. Not 50 times, but I went down the hill and fell and went down the hill and fell. And he's watching me go down the hill and fall and go down the hill and fall and go down the hill and fall. And eventually, I, I didn't fall one time, and that's how I learned how to ride a bike. It's, I learned things the hard way. That's just me. But anyway, so I was excited about a bike. Um, later on, uh, um, you know, you're in your 20s, and you get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. If you're a boy, you get a girlfriend. If you get a girl, you get a boyfriend. I just want to make that straight. And, and, um, and, and in that, during that time, and, um, and you're excited about it. So you tell everybody. I mean, there's some people that don't tell people. But most people, like, they're excited, and they want to tell everybody about, about their boyfriend, their girlfriend, especially when they get the ring, you know, when the, then it's really serious. They definitely want to tell everybody and all that. That's normal, right? I mean, we, we understand that. That's normal. And then you're middle-aged, and you're talking about your kids. You know, they're moving from, they're in high school and all their accomplishments and their sports, and, and then they go into, they, they graduate from high school, and they're going to college, and they get scholarships, and you're, you're talking about that all the time. This is, now, now you want to tell everybody about your excitement. And then, and then you, you get into um, middle-age plus. Um, I don't want to say it. You know, it's just middle-age plus, or my grandfather says it this way approaching middle age from the other side. So, so you're, you're, you're middle age plus, you're approaching middle age, and then the kids don't matter anymore. It doesn't matter about them. It's the grandkids. Now we're going to talk about the grandkids and all the different accomplishments the grandkids and how great the grand, grand, grandkids are. And then after that, you... Never mind. Um, so, <laughs> so you're excited about... You're excited about what you're experiencing. And these folks were excited. This was real. And they're excited about what they're experiencing, and they want to tell people. See, it tells us something about our mission. See, our mission is not, man, I better, I better go and I better tell like five people a day, you know, about the Lord, because that's my duty. No, have you experienced the Lord? Have you experienced the resurrection in your own life? Then you want to tell people. It's just a natural thing. It's not... I gotta shove it down their throat. I gotta make sure they understand. I got no. I just I, I wanna I wanna tell people about my Jesus, and I wanna tell people about the security that I have and the hope that I have, because I underst I've looked at the scriptures. I've seen what it all says, and the resurrection is really clear. Now I'll just say this: when you read the different accounts of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and you put them all together, you cannot come up with any conclusion but that the Bible, the Bible is an account of what happened, number one. It's not, it's not fiction. It's, not, it's an account of what happened and that it is declaring the actual literally, literal bodily of the resurrection. You can't get around it. There's definitely no way of getting around that. Now, you can believe what it says as the account or not. You, you have to make that decision, but but that's what it's saying. There's, you, I mean, there's people that come up with all kinds of different ideas and different th thoughts, which actually brings us to verses 11 through 15, and we begin to see the opposition. So in telling this, going and telling this mission, we find that there are people that have, are under op opposition. This is actually the case for all of church history. You have opposition. For example, there's like this something called the swoon theory, that Jesus actually never died. By the way, it's interesting that they say he actually never died because they understand that there was a risen, there was a, all these witnesses that saw him after, the, uh, after this entire event. But the swoon theory suggests that he actually never died. That was actually not, a, not invented until the 1600s, but, but that's, that was sort of the prevailing idea for a while. If you actually read the account of what happened with Jesus, you've got a spear going through his side, going into his heart, and blood and water coming out, there is absolutely no way that he just, you know, passed out or something, or going into a deep coma. You've got the hallucination theory, where all of the witnesses were just hallucinating him. That's 
500 people, according to 1 Corinthians 15, that hallucinated. Uh, that seems unlikely. It, it, that's not what happened. And then you have the telepathy theory, which is God gave all of these divine messages to people. So they're recognizing that there is a God, and he gave divine messages, but they can't believe in the resurrection. I'm, that's one. Or the seance theory, that they saw the Spirit of Christ, not his body. And in John 20, but that, but that can't be it, because you've got in John 20, for instance, he's given fish to eat. He's, he's eating food. <laughs> so you have all these theories, but actually the theory started with a conspiracy that, that, that's actually in this text. And this conspiracy that we're going to see in a minute actually lasted for about, from what church history, from what we could tell, about 100 years or so, roughly around there, maybe between 50 and 100 years. Justin Martyr actually mentions this, and he was in the second century. This lasted a long time. So let's look at this, verse 11. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests, all the things that happened. So remember, they fell as dead. I guess they woke up or whatever, and they, just, they won't, Jesus is not there, and, and now we're in trouble, and they don't know what to do. They don't go to Pilate. Very likely, they don't go to Pilate, who is their, you know, their, their, their leader, because what would happen if they go to Pilate? They're supposed to guard a body. The body's gone. What, what's going to happen to them? You're right. They're going to they're die. So they don't go to them. They go to these chief priests instead. They go to, they go to these, uh, the religious leaders instead, and... Um, and explain what happened. In verse 12, it says that all the Sanhedrin gathered together and assembled with the elders and consulted together and gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. They're going to bribe these soldiers. So the soldiers said, well, we went to the right people. We're going to get money out of this. So they, they bribe them. And why do they bribe them? Here's what they tell them to tell, say to everybody. Tell them, verse, verse 13, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And, if, if, and they're like, well, um, what if we get in trouble? It's probably the natural reaction. Verse 14, they got to an answer for that. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. It's, it's sort of funny because they, they, make, they actually assume the governor's not going to believe this. Like, like they're going to know something's up. If it comes to the governor's ear that, that they fell asleep, um, uh, that, that, um, uh, that they'll, they'll, they'll take care of that. Verse 15 so what did they do? Well, they took the money and did as, as they instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Matthew was written about 61, 62, 63 BC, somewhere around there. And so you, ha you actually have this, this kind of conspiracy um, moving on. Now, what's interesting about conspiracy, on it, cons this conspiracy is on its face, we've got serious problems with this. I think the most... Um, the most, well, there's several things. One is, the idea that they fell asleep is a far-fetched idea, that they just kind of conked out and the disciples came and stole the body. That, that, it, it's not likely. In fact, what we find from history is that the Roman guard, they were very strict on taking three-hour shifts, and they would actually rotate the soldiers. So that's very unlikely that they fell asleep. The most glaring, there's other is issues as well, but the most glaring problem you could actually see right in the text they are telling people that they fell asleep, but they know who stole the body. Well, how are they supposed to know who stole the body? They fell asleep. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. The disciples, they're like, the disciples stole the body. Well, how do you know? Well, we fell asleep, and they did. Like, they're, they're not eyewitnesses to anything, because they're asleep. So how do they know what happened? So do you see, on the one hand, you have this sort of contrast where you've got these four ladies, they're observing the crucifixion, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and, and it's, it's pretty airtight here. And then on the other hand, you've got the soldiers, they, they passed out, is what it looks like, and they go to the guard and they make up a story that actually spreads everywhere. It turns out that this story actually ends up corroborating the very truth that we know to be true because people listen to that and they go, well, wait a minute, how did you know the disciples stole the body if you're asleep? It's a very shaky ground that we find when we, when we see this particular conspiracy. Why? There's something else, though. 
when, the, when they come to the religious leaders, did you notice what the religious leaders didn't do? When they come to these chief priests, do you know what they didn't do? They didn't say, oh, really? What actually happened? They were not concerned about the truth. Did you, did you catch that? They didn't say anything about, okay, well, what's actually true here? Let's get together and decide what, is, what actually took place, and we'll let everybody know what actually took place. That's not what they did. Why? I mean, you know, uh, they've, they've definitely been against Jesus all along. They've definitely, you know, we, we understand that, but why? You know why? Because at the end of the day, people believe what they want to believe, Right? I mean, that's just the way it is. People believe what they want to believe. And these chief priests, if Jesus really is who he said he was, they're going to lose their authority. They're going to lose their influence. They're going to lose their power. They might lose their money. They're, they're going to, their life is going to change drastically if Jesus actually, in their mind anyway, actually it wouldn't necessarily, but in their mind, that this was everything was going to change because he was, Jesus was so popular before he died. So what, they, what the bottom line is, they, they believe what they wanted. They chose, to re, they chose to be, they really chose to not listen to the truth, and they chose to spin it their way. And it's interesting that, that you find in the debate over the resurrection of Christ, when people actually look at the account, and they are fair-minded about looking at all of these different accounts and analyzing everything, you have some that legit, that they will say, I... I don't see it. I don't see the actual resurrection of Christ here. But then you have others that are very fair-minded with nothing, with no presupposition. They're just looking at all of, all of the evidence. And like Oxford professor Thomas Arnold said, this is what he said after looking at all of the, ex, uh, all of the evidence. I know of no one fact in history of mankind which proves better and fuller evidence of any sort of every sort, to understand a, of a fair inquirer that great sign which God had given us that Christ died and rose again. Have you really examined the evidence? Have you looked at all of the different accounts? Have you looked at it carefully and looked at all of this, to, looked at the historicity of it, considered all of it? And then if you have, what conclusion would you make? It's either a lie, the Bible's lying, or the Bible is true, and Jesus did bodily rise from the grave. There, when you examine it, that's your two choices. It's very clear that those are the two options. And what we see is that Jesus did, of course, we believe that Jesus rose from the grave. Now, this, is, this story moves fast, because we pick up in verse 16, and the setting in verse 16 is now that they are in Galilee. A lot has happened. We, we read some of that in, begin, in the beginning, the very first thing that, that uh, Brother Ed read. We saw a lot of details of what was happening. But we have on, on a mount in Galilee, Jesus is there, and there, is, there are people assembling. Now, the text says that the 11 assembled. Of course, Judas wasn't with them. Um, but but you, you, you very likely have, from what I can see, and this is not guaranteed, but you very likely have far more than just the 11 disciples there. In fact, you probably have, you could have 500 people there witnessing uh, Jesus and his, in fact, at some point we know that happened because 1 Corinthians 15 tells us there were 500 witnesses. That could have happened right here, and you have all of these people that are gathered witnessing of the fact that Jesus is truly alive. The, the death of Christ, by the way, is not really in dispute, okay? I mean, people will recognize historically that there was a man who was crucified, who died, and there, there's, there's multiple. It is really, what is in dispute is the resurrection because when you come to the realization that it, he did rise from the grave and people did see him, then you are compelled to believe that he is who he said he was. There's really no way around it. And that's what we have here in the text. They're gathered, the 11 disciples went away in Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. In verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So they're worshiping. 
They, they realize who Jesus is. He is the Lord. But they actually, actually says here in the text that some doubted. By the way, that's another indication that this text is an actual account. It doesn't read like it's just promoting that everybody who ever saw him believed in him. Even after the resurrection, they see him, and there are many that worship. They put all these things together. They understand who he is, but there are some that doubted. They, they, the, the word indicates that they hesitated. Well, there's a sense in which you can understand that. I mean, this is, this is mind-blowing, right? This doesn't happen. It just doesn't actually happen. People don't rise from the grave. They worship, and, they are, they, and there are some that doubt. But what we're, the, what we're going to see then is that Jesus is going to say something next in verse 18 that puts this in perspective. He's going to say, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now that's a pretty important phrase. The reason that is important is to understand that what Jesus, Jesus has now begun a new, a new phase, if you will, where he has all authority. Now, he's still going to execute authority, like, in fact, in the future, he's going to ex execute authority differently than he is now. But he has, according to the text, all authority. And we see in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider him robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon the form of a bondservant, Coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So he died, verse 9, Therefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those, in, those on earth and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the text it says, hath highly exalted him. He is highly exalted, and then he, every knee, will, future tense, bow. So, so Jesus is exalted as authority. He is the authority, and one day we will look ahead to when Jesus will come back, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. So what are we doing in the meantime? We have now the objective. The objective here is in verses 19 through 20. It says this. This is... The, the, the objective of our going. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. The main command in this passage is to make disciples. That's what God desires us for us to do. Now, keep in mind, in order to make disciples, what we're talking about here is that we're not, we're not trying to coerce people to do something that they don't want to do. We are witnessing to people to do what we have, to, to, to come and view what we've experienced. Come and see. It's almost like the angel said, come see. We want people to come and see. Look at the scriptures. Look at what it says. I, I've un, I, you know, I understand the truth of the scriptures and I've, I've received it and it's made, I, I, I believe it. Would you come and examine what you see? And what we see in scripture is that this is the message. It was actually the message of the resurrection that was the message that was presented throughout the book of Acts. I don't have, to, I, I, I don't have time to show you that. But throughout the book of Acts, the main message was Jesus rose from the grave. They all knew somebody died. They all knew Jesus died. That was, happened, you know, pretty recently. But the message was he rose from the grave. Folks, that really actually becomes our message for people, that Jesus is alive. I mean, the fact is, 1 Corinthians 15 is very clear that if Jesus is dead, our faith is vain. We're yet in our sins. It doesn't matter a hill of beans if Jesus died if he didn't rise from the grave. But if he rose from the grave, if he actually bodily rose from the grave, that claim is different than the claims of other people in other situations. That claim, we have to be confronted with that, and we have to decide, okay, is that claim of the bodily resurrection, is that a true claim, or is that a false claim? And if we conclude from the evidence that it is a true claim, then we know that what Jesus did on the cross is true, that he died to take our sin on himself 
and he rose from the grave victorious over sin and death. And so the method of doing this is that those who would come to Jesus, who would trust them as their Savior, would want to identify with Christ in baptism, and then we should teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The bot text says, Lo, I am with you always. Jesus promises this, even to the ends of the earth. One thing I want us to note, though, in the passage, would you notice this? It says who, who is to be included in this. Would you notice it says of all nations? See, Jesus wants, wants this gospel to be spread to, and be available to everyone. I, I want to make that clear here that the gospel of Christ is not intended to be nation-specific. It's not. It It is intended to go out to every kindred, tribe, and nation. It is intended to go out to every ethnic group. That is the intention of God. We never want to think of the gospel as being a being going toward a specific nation. It is for everyone. And that's the, the, that's the wonderful glory of the gospel. In fact, what you find as you go through the New Testament, God desires his church to be built up of, every, of all kinds of different people. And that there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. No, they're all one in Christ. God desires for that to occur. So as we think about the mission of the resurrection, there are three things we need to consider. Number one, the mission begins by experiencing Jesus. The mission begins. That's the, the whole thing begins by experiencing Jesus. I mean, if you haven't experienced Jesus, you can't tell somebody else about Jesus. It's like witnessing a car accident. If you didn't see it happen, you're no, you're no help, right? You know, I, I don't know about you, but you come to a car accident, you know, you, and you see it, and, you, and uh, you're kind of hoping that as you drive by that you didn't actually see it because you don't want to stop and have to deal with that. You know, I don't know if you go through that kind of thing and be a witness for all that and get involved in all that. But if you didn't see it, you're not going to be a particular, particularly helpful in witnessing. But if you did and you were an eyewitness, then it really, it really matters. So what God is saying here in this passage, he's teaching us that we, we're not an eyewitness of the resurrection, but do we with our hearts believe in the eyewitnesses of the resurrection? Do we choose to believe in the eyewitnesses of the resurrection as it is declared in Scripture? That's where the whole thing starts. Can I ask you, do you believe? Do you believe in the resurrection of Christ? Do you understand that, I mean, think about this world that has gone wrong, as the song said earlier. The world has gone wrong, and I think all of us understand that. You look around, and it's gone wrong. <laughs> Isn't it true that our own hearts have gone wrong, too? I mean, just, just look at our own hearts for a minute. And we, we, we have to admit that the heart, my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Even Martin Luther, as great as he was, realized that his greatest acts were actually just to lift himself up and make himself feel better. I mean, he, he re, it, there really is a, a heart problem that we're all born with called sin. And sin separates us from God. And God must judge sin. But Jesus died to take on our sin and receive the judgment of God so that we could have his righteousness uh, applied to us because his, our sin is placed on him. The Bible says this, but as many as receive him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Can I encourage you? I, I'm just telling you as one who's received Jesus. I don't want to force it down anybody's throat. I don't, want it, I don't want it to be something where somebody's going against their will or anything like that. But honestly, I, I know, you know, it's like the song says, um, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. I've experienced Jesus. I understand what the Bible says. I've examined all of this, and it comes out that Jesus is exactly who he says he was. And I encourage you, just, under, just take the time to examine this. And if you have any questions at all, 
I'd be happy to take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you will spend eternity with the Lord. And, and, and if you have questions about the resurrection, how it all worked, or the death of Christ or anything, man, I am here to help. I'd be glad to take a Bible and show you or just, just talk with you um, to, so that you can understand more about how you can have a relationship with the Lord through Jesus. Number two, there's going to be opposition. If you are, let's face it, if, we've, if we are, have experienced Jesus, we've experienced the resurrection, then there is going to be opposition. There's going to be some people that really don't, really don't want us to, to, to say the things that we say. Uh, there are some, there's going to be conspiracies and things that, that we have to deal with. Uh, let's treat the opposition as, and understand that ultimately the Lord will have his way and we need to stick to the truth of the scriptures that are so clear to us. And then the mission objective is to make disciples. This is an important point that I don't have time to develop. But understand that God's desire is for people who understand this to follow him that, that their mission in life would be to help others come to Jesus as well. And if you are here today and you don't know the Lord, let me just encourage you. This, just, just understand that he died for you and you can, you, can, you can accept him as your Lord and Savior today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you and thank you and praise you for the truth of your word. We thank you for uh, how it, it shows us so clearly with airtight eyewitnesses of the account that you are, Christ truly did literally bodily rise from the grave. And we celebrate that, we glory in that. It is our hope, it is our joy. And may we take the very admonition of Jesus as he met those ladies to rejoice. Lord, may we rejoice as well. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hello, my name is Jim Ganam, Senior Pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for streaming our service. We hope and pray that it was truly a blessing to you. You know, we live in a day where we have access to the preaching of God's Word with just a phone or a tablet or with a couple of clicks on our computer. But we really would love to meet you in person. You know, there is just nothing that really replaces the experience of being in a loving community. Here at BBC, you'll be greeted by people who genuinely want to help you to have the best experience you can possibly have. If you have a family, we can help your kids find their fun, interactive classes, and your littlest ones can get settled into our safe, fun, and well-equipped nursery. Then help yourself to a cup of coffee and join us for the main service for singing, praying, and the preaching of God's Word. Although we'd love to have you visit our church, this is not our greatest concern for you. Our greatest concern is that you know how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, I want to let you know about a resource that will help you with this. It is called The Exchange. The Exchange is an easy-to-use, four-week guide that helps people to learn how they can have a relationship with God according to the Bible. If you contact us, we'd love to give you a copy while supplies last, and we'd also love to meet with you either in person or over the phone or over a FaceTime or Zoom video call so we can walk you through this helpful resource. If you're interested in going through the Exchange Bible Study with us, or if you just have a need we can pray for, may the Lord richly bless you. We hope to see you soon.